Our conversation um, is going to focus on the Truth and Reconciliation Initiative that we have launched, which um, also is part of a documentary series that we premiered on Nelson Mandela International Day with your participation, of course. What I'd like to do, Dr. Mandela, is to jump right into this. Um, in America, we, as you well know, are in the midst of huge social upheavals around our politics, around how we treat each other as just as human beings, and more specifically, how this will impact the rest of the world, because what we do is not happening in a vacuum. And so I'd like to just start by focusing on three core questions. One, I'd like to hear your perspective on racism as a South African and the daughter of former president of South Africa, the first president of democratic South Africa, Nelson Mandela. As well, um, I'd like to move on from there to your response to George Floyd's murder, and then your hope for race relations uh, in the world. So let's go right into this. And I, I'd just like you to tell me, Dr. Mandela, what are your thoughts? What, are your, what is it that comes to mind to you uh, in the current climate of social upheaval with respect to racism, systemic racism? Well, uh, um, Khalil, I think uh, racism is, is a cancer that is actually festering in most societies, not just America. Um, I think that uh, what has happened is that uh, if I look at America and I look at South Africa, because they are close examples, is that, uh, you know, the issue of uh, social justice, of addressing inequities in society, has, is something that we have not addressed fully. Because whether you want to talk, whether you want to talk about truth and reconciliation, as we've gone through in South Africa, if truth and reconciliation addressing the inequities of the past, the oppression of a group of people by another who are dominant, uh, not just politically, but economically, and we don't understand the history of those countries and try to talk about these issues openly. For example, in America, talk about the issue of slavery and how Slavery really was the backbone of the economic sector in America, just as apartheid in South Africa uh, was the backbone of the South African economy, which is the most eco uh, advanced economy in Africa. Then really, I do not think that we come to a true reconciliation uh, in, uh, among the different classes or different people. And I think that, you know, for us who are outside the U.S., I think when we saw what happened to George Floyd, it, 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 it invoked in us remembrances of apartheid. And I think, uh, I, and we were filled with a lot of rage that a human being, another human being, could actually do this to another human being put a knee on somebody's neck in broad daylight uh, for more than 60 minutes so, or, or so and, and kill an individual really who was not armed. Uh, so it was just a shocking thing to, to view. And I think that's why it sparked so much anger around the world and protest around the world. So when you look at this um, unrest, um, and protests that are happening, not just in America, but around the world. As a South African, how um, do you feel that this is relevant to addressing 
the global challenges that we face. And I'm just going to say here, particularly as black people and people of color. What do you mean, what is relevant? I mean, like if you look at, we're, we're now in a protest stage and mm -hmm. we've been through this before. We, we have seen injustices, brutal injustices. This is not the first time. Um, what I do recognize about this historic moment is that in America in particular, we are told, uh, we know that in, by the year 2045, America will be minority white. This has significant implications for how our institutions have functioned historically. Um, and so when I think about the instance of George Floyd in the eight minutes and 46 seconds of his assassination by police officers, those who are sworn to serve and protect, what I do recognize as well is that these kinds of injustices and uh, brutal contradictions of democracy are not unique to America. And so for me, being, you being the daughter of Nelson Mandela who came out of this history of actually establishing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has very much inspired our work. When you look at South Africa and you look at America, what is it about the injustices that you see in America that inspires you to action? What is it that you can, uh, where do you see the connection between these injustices in America and what you have experienced uh, there in South Africa? Look, I, I mean, the, the, the history of slavery in America of enslaving uh, black people um, is not different from the history of apartheid where the Africaners also enslaved black people by uh, taking away their land by uh, uh, forcing them into menial labor, uh, demeaning them, uh, by making them um, uh, locked into rural areas and they, you know, they had to get permits to get into urban areas. Um, it's no different. But uh, Khalil, you know, the problem is with, 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 with protests, just as the same as the fight against apartheid is that these are not continuous uh, um, uh, movements or struggles. We go and we are comfortable with the status quo and we think things are, are okay. And I think that to really truly fight racism and end it, there, there needs to be continuing education and education which is emancipatory from actually the lower grades until university, because how do you fight? Because racism in my view is based on ignorance of the other. And so if you have ignorance of the other and you demonize those people, unless you are re educated, I mean, as my father says, people are not born hating one another. They are taught to hate. And if people are taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And I think here, for me, education is the great uh, equalizer. And so when, when we are in a space where we are talking about uh, digital education, the question has to be raised, what role is digital education in the 21st century going to play in terms of tackling issues of racism, issues of gender inequity, uh, issues of, of mass incarceration, issues of the poor people who have nothing. And because if you are looking at the fact that we are living in a critical era of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, more, the people who are most affected, whether it's in the US or here in South Africa by the pandemic, are the poor people who have very little resources, don't have medical aid and so forth. And so, um, I think the, the challenge for us is how do we use all the medium around us and even what you call 
truth and reconciliation conversation, conversations, whether it's in the home, in community, in schools, to be able to address openly these issues um, without uh, trying you know, to paper the cracks and say, but those are things that happened long time ago, they have nothing to do with the state in which we are. And, and actually talk very, very bluntly about the capitalist system, which is based be either on apartheid or the slavery of a certain um, color of people. You know, it's interesting that you say that because uh, one of the arguments that I have made around the kind of uh, mass incarceration that we have seen in America is that the disproportionality of people of color in prison is born of slavery, the, the experience of enslavement of Africans primarily. And so my fundamental position is that the enslavement didn't just represent slavery as we know it historically, but it also represented the creation of what I call a slave class. And this slave class ultimately becomes a prisoner, a prisoner class. So with the abolishment, with the end of slavery, we have a system that emerges that concentrates incarceration on a particular population. So ultimately, this whole ideal of the prison industrial complex is born of a prisoner class that came out of a slave class. Now, what I would like to kind of delve into a little bit deeper with you, that in South Africa, for example, you have a lot of colored people, classified, those colored, classified as colored people, who make the argument that many African Americans make here, and I'm talking about post-apartheid. In South Africa, you have coloreds who say that they are disproportionately arrested, disproportionately incarcerated, and disproportionately disadvantaged in the context of an apartheid system. How, how does this, how does this happen? What, what, what is your insight? What is your view of this kind of circumstance, because what I'm really talking about is something that goes to the argument of post-colonial Africa and the period here in America where we, on one hand, argue that we have made immense civil rights gains, and at the same time, we're finding these deep entrenched contradictions within our communities that are happening by our own hand. They're not something that's externally being imposed, but it clearly is a case that we have internalized some really, really um, unhealthy aspects of oppression that we've not come to terms with. So, so I'm asking this question, it's a, it's a complicated question, but I want to know how- I don't, I don't, I don't think it's complicated. I, 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 I do think, though, and I'm not uh, uh, um, being apologist for Black people. Yes. When, when, when I came to America, and I'll give you an example. I came to America as a Fulbright scholar. Um, and uh, uh, we had orientation in Washington, D.C. And as we were taken around Washington, D.C., when we were taken to, through certain neighborhoods, I knew that these neighborhoods where black people lived because the conditions of those neighborhoods were run down and it reminded me of the ghettos that you see here in South Africa um, and the squatter camps. And so um, one of the things you have to understand, systematic racism, which oppresses people, which takes away their rights and their dignity to human rights, to live as decent uh, human beings, doesn't give them access to opportunities, whether it's uh, education, it's employment, um, they have no right to vote, even the little land that they're given as compensation is taken away from them in terms of deepness. And they live in these high rise buildings, which are infestation of violence and crime because the system that they actually emerge out is a violent system. 
in the first place. Play battle was a violence system, apartheid was a violent system. So what do you expect of people who have little, that it's a self-perpetuating system and it affects people psychologically and otherwise. And unless there yeah. is massive education to actually bring back the dignity and there's actually a systematic effort to address the iniquities of the past and to look at the history, how it has affected a certain group of people, Blacks in this instance, I don't think that we overcome the issues of racism. We can make strides in terms of civil rights, but I don't think we actually get to the core of addressing racism in these societies. One of the things that I want to make sure that we address in this conversation, uh, Dr. Mandela, is how do we begin to think about our complicity as oppressed people in the oppression that we are fighting against? What does that, what does that look like? What, what does that mean for you um, in the context of our, our struggle um, for social justice? I think for me, what it means simply is that I, I don't think that we're complicit. I, I think those of us who, who have managed to be successful, who have managed to uh, overcome uh, the systematic racism in our societies through education, through coming from perhaps privileged middle class homes, we have a heavy duty and a responsibility to be able to help those who are less privileged than us in our societies and in our communities. Uh, and, 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 and as I said, through education, because I think education is, is the great equalizer. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's not just the former education, it's, this, it's a certain type of education that emancipates people's mind and, and, and people's hearts. Because if we are not going to be able to address and have empathy for those who are less privileged than us, then uh, I don't think that we, we can succeed. Yes. I, so I apologize for the um, inconsistencies in this broadcast. I'm actually speaking from Athens, Greece. And so without a excuse, I take full ownership for the lack of um, technological connection in this presentation. But what I want to go to the point, speak to the point of is that as a formerly incarcerated person, I know that I created harm in my community. I know that there was a period in my life where I was part of, more part of the problem than the solutions that our community desperately needed. So when I talk about um, complicity, I'm talking about complicity in the context of recognizing that there are some things that we have done historically and presently. Dr. Mandela, the, the reason why I was raising the point of complicity, I don't know how much of my previous comment that you heard, but mm -hmm. my point is that there are those of us in our community who also must recognize that crime in our communities and rates of incarceration in our communities are not just a matter of the kind of external challenges that we're faced with. There's a desperate need. Dr. Mandela, though I'm saying complicity and I'm happy to hear that you say you don't believe we are complicitous in the kind of injustices or the kind of um, oppression that we face in our communities. And so what I would like to ask you more directly is, how do we address those in our community who are committing crimes, who are engaging in behavior and actions that, um, make our community more vulnerable and more at risk and more endangered. How do you, how do you respond to that? And what would you call 
that behavior, for example? I don't know what, I, I mean, um, I think the issue of criminality exists in, in every society. It might be more pronounced in, in our society because of the history that we come from. And I'm not excusing a uh, criminal behavior, but I think that uh, especially in America, you know that there's a, there's a, there's a pipeline from from school to prison pipeline. And, and so um, uh, when you lock people up and you see people as just, uh, you know, uh, their use is to be just cheap laborers and to, to fill the prisons of a particular society, um, then I think there's a problem there. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think that there are also a lot of examples of people who come from those backgrounds who when they get through proper rehabilitation processes um, uh, are given access to education, are given a set of skills that those individuals are actually um, um, rehabilitated permanently. So uh, um, in, in your case, for example, you came from a privileged home. Yes. Uh, you, you made a choice uh, in terms of the life that you wanted to, uh, to live and there were consequences to the choices that you made. And so um, for all of us, we, you know, we have choices, but I would argue and argue strongly that for the very poor in society, who basically have no hope and uh, who grew up in the squatter camps, um, I wouldn't say that they have choices. You know, their choices are very limited in the environment in which they live. And uh, because we all have to um, um, actually satisfy our needs for, for, for growth, uh, we have to have the roof over our head, we have to eat, People will find who are poor will find any means to satisfy those needs. Yes, yes. In, in in the context of people finding any means to fulfill those needs, my challenge with this is: if we are engaged in activity that continues to damage our community, to make our community more healthy, if we become predators in such a way that our communities become more violent and more insecure and more um, a case. Uh, Khalil, I would say the answer to that, uh, and, 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 and I think you know it, I've seen it in Florida when I went uh, there, is to start programs like, uh, for example, Kevin Gay has started, which is the Operation Hope which gives people hope. People all over the world, doesn't matter where you come from, yes. need to know that there is hope in life. And, and, and I think, I don't think that people are born with evil intent in them. Um, yes. I, I, I think people can be rehabilitated if we improve our communities, if we make sure that they, they have access to all the opportunities that other people get a uh, middle class rich, I, I think that you will see that in those communities where an effort is made to improve the community and to uplift that community out of poverty, the levels of crimes diminish. Well, Dr. Mandela, um, I just, because I know time is short and we're faced with a number of technological challenges, one of the things that I want to close on is a question to you about your hope for the future of race relations. What is it that, given everything that you've been through and all of the challenges that you um, see currently, both in South Africa and America and around the world, because you travel extensively, what is your hope?
Well, my hope, I mean, I, I haven't lost hope in human beings. I think that, uh, um, um, look, human beings have good within them. And I think that we just have to tap into that good because if change cannot happen by legislation, by protest, change will come when people are committed in both mind and heart. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a, there's a uh, uh, for me, the important thing is that I've seen that there are good people who are black and white and there are bad people who are black and white. So we, we you know, I haven't lost hope in human beings. I think that uh, we have made it so far. If I look at where South Africa comes from and where we are now, South Africa is a completely different country from when I, I was born and grew up. Um, uh, but we still are faced with a lot of challenges. I have no doubt in my mind. But I think that we should not give up on making these efforts. And I think that uh, it is important that these issues are discussed openly and actually are uh, actually part of our education curriculum uh, because in that way we are able to store, stem the ignorance in society amongst us. So do you think that the majority of South Africans at this stage are also hopeful? I also what? Do you think that they're hopeful? Do you think that the majority of South Africans at this stage and in um, post-apartheid uh, independence, do you think that they're hopeful? Uh, yes and no, because as I said, I mean, I, uh, uh, the South Africa is different today from what it was, but uh, uh, I have to be honest that we are faced with a lot of challenges. You know, um, uh, uh, still a lot of people are living in poverty. Uh, there's a high rate of corruption in this country um, at all levels. And so, uh, but people haven't lost hope. And I, and I think that uh, what I, I like about South Africa is that civil society organizations have not given up. They've been uh, quiet for some time, but uh, their voices are coming up. And I think that South Africans tend to speak out more on injustices that are happening around them. So, and the young people in this country are actually taking the cudgel to make sure that things go in the right direction. So I, I, I am very hopeful about South Africa, despite the fact that we are faced with tremendous challenges. And I think that's the best place where we can join hands. Doug Mandela, um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for making time. No, that it's a very late hour in South Africa. And I also want to say that I know when you tell, when you talk about this need to personally um, engage in this process of change and transformation and how you have seen a transformation in South Africa, I know that it's something that you take um, personally, having in America when I was in prison, um, I know that you have a consciousness for social justice. And so uh, I'm inspired by your hope. Dr. Mandela, are there any closing remarks you'd like to share with our audience um, as uh, we bring this session to an end? Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, I think that we should co keep hope alive, as uh, Martin Luther King said, uh, and we should not give up. And I think it's, it's the responsibility of each and one of us actually um, to, to participate in ending racism in this world. Well, I just want to say thank you for making time. Thank you for your commitment to struggle for justice. Thank you for being a friend to me and 
participating in this discussion for ASU GSB, because I think there's a lot of people who are going to hear what you say and be inspired by your words and recognize that by joining together, by recognizing our shared or our collective responsibility for transformation, that we recognize there's something we can do together that's greater than what we can do by ourselves. So in closing, I just uh, like to, to actually share with our viewers and listeners words from your father. He said, our society is not divided and, or separated by race, color, And fools divide themselves by race, color, gender, or religion. So this idea that we are divided is something that we are fully capable of overcoming through a simple recognition of our shared humanity. And for me, your personal life has been that. Your example and your journey with me in our terms of our conversations over the years uh, has been an inspiration uh, on that level. So I'd like to just say thank you, uh, Dr. Mandela, and um, I want you to know how deeply I appreciate your continued effort and your continued struggle to lift up the So thank you, Dr. Mandela. It's been thank a joy to have this opportunity to be with you. Thank you.